Hello and welcome. My name is Jane Gunn and I'm the Dean of the Faculty of Medicine, Dentistry and Health Sciences here at the University of Melbourne. And I'd like to thank you for joining us for today's discussion, Pre-Teens and Screens, Encouraging Healthy Relationships with Technology. Before we begin the seminar, I would like to acknowledge the elders, both past, present and emerging, of the Wurundjeri people, who are the custodians of the land of which I'm on. And I also acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands you are on um, and pay a special welcome to any Indigenous colleagues joining us today. Today's event is a part of the Faculty's In Pursuit of Health series. And this is a series which aims to bring the community together to discuss issues that are important to them. Today, our seminar coincides with the milestone 150th anniversary of the Royal Children's Hospital, a very important partner to the university. And this year's series is focused on child and adolescent health. When colleagues at the Royal Children's Hospital announced the findings of their national parent poll earlier this year, excessive screen time was the number one health concern for parents. And I'm sure that for many of you, uh, many who will be in lockdown at this moment, that this is a pressing issue for you right now. So today, we've brought together a multidisciplinary panel spanning health, media and parenthood, and we hope that you will gain some practical strategies and insights into what healthy screen behaviour might look like in your families. I'm delighted to welcome our panel members, and I'm sure you'll find them a, a, a fascinating bunch. Um, I'd like to start by welcoming Professor Sarath Ranganathan, who will be moderating the, dis the discussion today. Sarath is the Stevenson Chair and Head of the Department of Paediatrics at the University of Melbourne. Dr. Lisa Mundy is a developmental psychologist from the Murdoch Children's Research Institute. And Dr. Michael Carr Gregg is a clinical psychologist, author, and broadcaster. Dr. Anthea Rhodes, a paediatrician and founding director of the RCH National Child Health Poll. And Dr. Bjorn Nansen, a digital media researcher here at the University of Melbourne. We're also joined by Pauline Loftus Hills, a community engagement professional and mother of a preteen and Anne Kelly Tallon, who is the Online Harms Policy Manager at the Australian Office of the eSafety Commissioner. So welcome everyone. I'm really looking forward to hearing the discussion and I'll see you again at the end of the seminar. So now over to you, Saraf, for our In Pursuit of Health seminar. Thank you very much, Jane. And uh, once again, in the midst of another disappointing lockdown, very grateful for you to be able to join us today. Um, we had 850 registrants, which is quite incredible, and it shows that this is obviously quite an important topic. Two thirds of you that have registered are parents, and a third are academics. Uh, many of those are colleagues in the University of Melbourne, but I think their prime motivation today is also because they are parents. What we're aiming to do is to try and get a better understanding of how screens are influencing our young children in our society and to try and find ways to manage that better um, as long as we're aware of the pros and cons of that in, in relation to the sort of culture around children and their use of screens. Personally I've got three children, um, a, a 21 year old, a, an 18 year old and a 14 year old and so I've seen the increasing importance of screens in their lives. Joining us today, and the first person that I want to um, question in this panel to get us all going is Pauline Loftus-Hills. Pauline, you're a parent. How does this particular issue around screen time resonate with you in relation to the experiences with your family? Thanks, Sarath. Mm. Yeah, I guess further to what Jane just mentioned, um, it, from a personal point of view as a parent, excessive screen time would definitely be um, one of my main concerns, and I guess particularly over this pandemic period, uh, we like to call it in our house screen creep, where all of a sudden one hour turns to two, turns to three, and we do worry as parents what that's doing to our kids' uh, brains and bodies, um, and further to that, the conflict that it causes in our home and trying to set and keep boundaries around um, 
screen time to try and avoid that conflict. And I guess there's some deeper issues and concerns as, as a parent that I would have in terms of, particularly for um, preteens is stumbling over inappropriate material um, inadvertently and that being a cause of concern in terms of any temporary or permanent scarring or even just loss of innocence, I guess. And then I guess a more serious concern I would have both as a parent, as a community member would be online safety and any you know, recent reports of grooming, which don't just concern me, but kind of, yeah, really horrify me from a community point of view as well, that people so young are also being groomed um, and there is a risk there. So they would probably be my top three concerns as a parent at this point. They all sound very uh, important and I'm sure they resonate with most of our audience. I'll just turn to Anthea because um, Jane mentioned the, the Royal Children's Hospital poll. You are the, 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 provide some oversight in relation to that poll. Do you have any comments in relation to what Pauline said and, and how you think that resonates with the community that responded to your poll, Anthea? Thanks, Sarah. I, I think the first thing I would say, Pauline, is you are not alone in your concerns and all those things that you've just outlined really were echoed in our study where we um, reached out to over 2,000 parents across Australia, so living in all states and territories with children aged between birth and 17 years. Uh, and in that group, we had around 1,000 parents of children in the primary school age group, which is sort of the age group we're talking about today. Uh, they all told us about each of their children. So that was close to 4,000 kids. And the biggest concerns parents have um, relate to, as you've mentioned, excessive screen time. So worrying that there's just too much time being spent on screens. And then the concerns two and three, when we asked about all different health um, and lifestyle challenges for families, after excessive screen time, the next um, biggest concern was around cyberbullying and um, also other types of bullying that don't relate to the online space, but certainly cyberbullying was a big part of that. And then number three was internet safety. So when we asked parents what's worrying them most, those screen related issues you know, were right up at the top. And alongside that, they were bigger because of COVID. So Pauline mentioned, um, and as did Sarah, that we've been thrown, many of us, particularly those of us here in Victoria, but there, there certainly may be people tuning in today from New South Wales and other parts of Australia. But remote learning and, you know, being at home and in lockdown has made all of these things um, even bigger. So we found parents told us that screen use had gone up in their houses. Around 40% of parents were worried that new unhealthy habits had been formed during the pandemic. And again, they were worried about safety and content as well as time when it comes to screens in their home. Yeah, so those issues, Pauline, that you're bringing up seem to certainly be shared by many others. Um, Lisa, if we can turn to you, uh, you've collected some data on this in your research of just how much screen time uh, children are engaging with. That's right, Sarah. Um, so we've been following over 1,200 students from that primary school, middle primary school age through into secondary school. And the two really striking patterns I think that we've seen is that the media use really increases with that transition from primary to secondary school. So, um, you know, the kind of middle primary school years about um, 10 percent of students are reporting missing sleep but by the time um, we get into secondary school in year seven about one in four students are missing are reporting missing sleep because they're using their devices and, and obviously as they transition further through secondary school that that just increases um, and the other big um, and obviously with that transition to secondary school that's also when um, young people tend to get more ownership so we see a big increase in the number of students that have their own mobile phone and they have more autonomy over being able to choose their content things as well so I think it really highlights the importance of these pre-teen years in terms of equipping our kids with those those skills um, for being able to use media in a um, productive and, and safe way. Um, the other pattern I think we've probably seen through the CATCH data is the differences in the way that 
uh, boys and girls use media as well. So we see that girls are much more likely to be on um, social media using, um, you know, the sort of uh, Instagram, Snapchat, that sort of thing, whereas boys are much more likely um, to be on video, you know, using video games as well. So really thinking about how our children are using um, media as well. It's, it's not just a blanket approach. Yeah, Lisa, we've lost your video, but your, your voice is beautifully clear. Thanks for that. The okay. children must be gaining a, a lot of positive reinforcement about their screen time. Um, certainly, um, my, my children, they enjoy, they love being on screens. And so I, I'm going to turn to you now, Bjorn, because I, I just want to explore this a little bit about what children are gaining, the positive elements of, of screen time. So uh, Bjorn, through your work, uh, what's your perception about the sort of culture that the children are now engaging with with screens? Yeah, thanks, Rath. So, yeah, so uh, with the social research I do with um, qualitative research with families and children, you know, interviews, observation, home-based research, is I think a real sense of ambivalence from parents of so recognising these health risks, but also acknowledging that there's a lot um, of, of, of value in what children um, do uh, in, you know, with and on their devices. A recognition that sometimes the language screen time can be quite reductive and that um, you know, it doesn't sort of take into account a lot of the, uh, the context and content of, uh, of children's um, uh, activities, which really they recognise are quite diverse um, and change with, with, um, with age. Um, and, and so, you know, there's a real sort of cultural value that children um, get out of, um, you know, the different activities they're doing uh, with their devices. So whether that's, you know, uh, you know, collaborating with a friend uh, online to, to win a round of Fortnite, whether that's learning to dance um, on TikTok, TikTok to do, you know, learn Renegade, whether that's, you know, building in Minecraft. There's a whole range of kind of social collaborative learning uh, activities um, that are in the specificities in the kinds of programs and, um, and, 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 and games and um, uh, platforms that children are on. And so a recognition that there's an ambivalence between trying to balance out, you know, those perceived health risks with what they see as the, the cultural benefits. And, and often this sort of comes back down to we discover with children's, uh, sorry, with parents' own backgrounds, you know, recalling their own sort of fondness for Saturday morning cartoons or, or early games or a generation before or comics. And so the idea that, you know, there is this kind of cultural value that they got and they want to instill in their children through those kind of memories and shared activities and, and forms of participation. And, and, and they, can get, they can get pleasure from engaging with children. And so in the, the parental mediation literature, as it were, you know, forms of co-viewing and co-playing can be helpful for guiding children, but also for, for family um, leisure time and, and, and deriving pleasure as a family. So, you know, watching shows together, playing games together, um, depending on, on, on what, um, you know, children are, are interested in at the time, that those kind of shared moments within families can be really productive, both, um, uh, for, you know, just for leisure and pleasure, but also for kind of learning and, and building those kinds of capacities and resilience for further and, and future forms of digital um, interactions. Thanks, Bjorn. Certainly playing games together. My children used to love humiliating me by coming last in Mario Kart every time. Um, Anthea, in terms of yeah. sort of other learning opportunities, could you just comment on, on uh, around that and the benefits there for children? Yeah, so echoing there what you've you've highlighted, Bjorn, we found also in the in our poll of parents that they do see and experience those positives for their kids. So, um, you know, around three quarters of parents said that they noted increased social connections and the benefits that had come from that through use of screens, particularly during the pandemic when they were surveyed towards the end of last year. Um, we also found that they felt that there were new skills being learned both by themselves. So around half of parents said through COVID, they'd learned new skills with the increased um, need to engage through technology. And two thirds of them said their kids had learned new skills. So definitely positives there in terms of their um, engagement socially and their learning opportunities. And we know, you know, wearing my hat now as a developmental paediatrician, that all of those things do happen through those processes as well. So exercise that happens um, as a type of play where technology might actually be the medium for that play and engagement is still bringing those benefits that we see through play that doesn't involve technology. So the short version is, I guess, parents also know there's positives and it's not all bad. Um, the challenge is for them, you know, how they harness those and limit the things that are worrying them. Yeah, so in, in relation to the, the, the positives then, Pauline, um, you, you've heard 
Bjorn and, and Anthea. I presume that resonates that parents recognize that the positives. I just wonder in your own family what your experience is there. Yeah, I guess I've got um, three children, 16, 14 and nine, and particularly the nine year old um, further to what Anthea was saying, the instructional videos are, are wonderful, in particular for her. She's learned, taught herself to do all sorts of things, particularly when she's stuck at home. Cooking would be one of a son who's taken up Dutch and that was through no influence of anyone else in the house, but he decided that would be an easy language to learn. So he's, he's that's technology at its best, I think. Um, and I think the other thing, there's a bit of levity as well and a bit of in, the enjoyment factor that Bjorn was talking about because um, they do say, oh, mum, look at this, this is funny, or have you seen this? And that's a, a way of connecting with them too for things that they've been viewing or looking at. They share it with their grandparents who live in the state or their aunts and uncles who live abroad. So um, that's a really um, central part in terms of technology for our families is the connection of the sharing of funny things. So that levity, particularly at this time, um, has been a real bonus for us, I guess. Um, I think though, what we should move on to now, because you've brought this up, Pauline, and, and, and certainly in the poll, are, are some of those concerns and challenges that we're facing with, um, with screens for, for young children. And I think this is a, a good point to um, bring Michael into the, into the discussion. Uh, Michael, as, as a psychologist, are, are you seeing any impacts that you believe to be associated with screen time in terms of children's uh, mental health and well-being, for example? Thanks, Trath. Um, mm. I, I think the main impact has been um, from COVID itself. If you think about children, there's four things that they need to be doing. One is being with their friends. Uh, the second is going to school. The third is to emancipate from the adults around them gradually and figure out who they are. Fourthly, identity formation. I think all four of those key developmental tasks have been significantly thwarted by the lockdown. So it's quite difficult for me to separate out. Um, there's definitely been an increase in mental health presentations to the point where my next appointment is February. Uh, the next free one, and my colleagues are all in the same um, situation. So we're seeing more anxiety, more depression. Um, and I think that many are retreating to their rooms. Uh, they are spending a lot of time on uh, online. And therefore, the issues that I'm seeing relate very much to things like the cyberbullying, um, the gaming um, excessive screen time and conflict with parents and something that I am concerned about which is a real reliance on social media to the exclusion of anything else which seems to prompt some of my clients to make extremely detrimental comparisons both physically socially and academically with other people so they seem to be using social media almost as an alternate reality an escape, if you like, from uh, the boredom of their daily lives. Well, thank you, Michael. Um, that's sort of concerning. I, I just want to turn to Lisa because you mentioned before, Lisa, the CAT study. Could you just tell people what that stands for and, uh, and what the data from your study shows in relation to the challenges of screen time? Yeah, so the CAT study is the Childhood to Adolescence Transition Study, and we've been following um, so 1,200 students across those, those middle years and really looking at, as the name suggests, that transition into adolescence and some of those things that Michael was saying are so important during these years um, in terms of developing, in terms of, um, you know, kind of having their own um, identity formation, you know, engaging with peers, starting to move away from the family group, that sort of thing. So we've been um, really interested in some of the... Um, the factors that kind of influence um, some of those changes that happen across those years and of course the big one is, is uh, media use and so we've been looking at um, different types of media use so for example social media use um, we found that girls who were using high levels of social media and by high we're just talking about just over an hour of, of social media um, at sort of age 11 12 so that's actually sort of technically a year before you should even have a, a social media account um, were 
over two times more likely to experience depression and anxiety in, in middle adolescence. So really quite striking. And, and what's really important about the findings from the CAT study is that we've been able to track the same young people across these years. So there's some um, thought that maybe, you know, children who have emotional problems are more likely to, to turn to their devices and use social media, for example, in this case. But we um, were able to look at those children who had higher levels of emotional problems and, and these findings um, remained even whether, uh, whether they had emotional problems prior to starting to use social media or not. So, um, so basically it's, it's sort of an independent effect that seems to be being um, driven across these years. Um, for boys, we saw similar patterns, but it um, but when we controlled or sort of took into account prior emotional problems, then um, this, it, the kind of pattern wasn't so strong for boys. Um, and we've also found links as well between media use um, and later academic performance as well. So even watching lots of TV at, at sort of eight, nine years of age was linked with declines in their NAPLAN uh, performance um, two years later as well. So, um, so quite striking findings um, we've, we've been finding in the CARE study. Okay, so you're adding a few more concerns there to, to those uh, expressed by Michael. Um, now, before we turn to Kelly, um, uh, uh, because I think, Kelly, you, you'll have some very important things to say here. I just want to invite Bjorn uh, to comment around other aspects, I think. Um, uh, are there any, uh, we, we talk, we hear about, for example, data capture by big companies and things. Uh, you work in the media. Is, is there anything like that that's occurring in the sort of children's space? No, there, yes, there, yes, there is, Raf. And um, I think in mm. addition to the kind of uh, health concerns um, that are being raised here uh, about health and well-being, there's some other ones that I think many parents are aware of, and I think are getting a lot more prominence in the media around children's privacy, children's data, um, and and the kind of commercial uses and and, and or exploitation of that. I think there's some um, actually some interesting and, and positive moves in that space. Um, for example, last year, um, YouTube um, settled with uh, the FTC uh, in an agreement in which they would stop tracking children in the kids' YouTube app or if kids watching um, children's content on YouTube. Uh, and so they'd, be, uh, they'd stop tracking them in order to um, uh, produce targeted advertising. And so I think there's a, an increasing awareness of that and, and moves towards regulating, whether it's self-regulation or, or, or governmental kind of responses to that. Facebook has recently announced that for Instagram accounts of children under 18, of youth under 18, that they'll be set um, as private by default rather than public. So I think the platforms are kind of responding to this kind of pub public uh, the prominence of these issues and, and, and backlash about them. I mean, I think there's ongoing ones, um, particularly, um, uh, yeah, just around the kind of commercialization of, which is, you know, there's a long history of that with, with children's media, but how that, you know, within online spaces, that's often kind of um, escapes territorial kind of boundaries and is, is, is quite a difficult thing um, to manage. Thanks, Bjorn. So, so Kelly, um, you work in the office of the Safety Commissioner and, uh, and I think that you'll have very important things to say uh, around some of the things that Pauline brought up around cyberbullying, et cetera. Um, just for the audience, first of all, could you um, just describe the, the mission or the work of the eSafety Commissioner, the, the office, what you're aiming to do, and then perhaps provide some comments around that in terms of your experience uh, in, in uh, managing these issues like cyberbullying and, and, and other exposures to inadvertent materials on the internet, et cetera. Sure, thank you, Sarath. Mm -hmm. um, hopefully some of the audience members are familiar with our office, but for anyone who isn't, mm -hmm. eSafety was initially established in 2015, uh, originally as the Children's eSafety Commissioner. Um, over the course of the last few years, we've had our remit sort of expanded in, in fits and starts. Um, so over the course of 2017 and 2018, our remit was extended to promote online safety for people of all ages, um, that we do maintain a strong focus on the safety of children and young people in particular. Um, I thought I might just start by raising the sort of three pillars of our work broadly. Uh, the first of those is protecting and supporting individuals who are experiencing online harms, and that includes kids and their families. Um, and we have a couple of legislated schemes that I'll talk about in just a second around um, cyberbullying and image-based abuse that I think the audience will find particularly interesting. We also push for proactive and systemic change among industry players to lift their safety practices and try to prevent harms before they occur rather than just having those um, protective schemes at the bottom of the cliff. 
Um, we also work on prevention through evidence-based educational resources and programs for a variety of audiences, and that includes kids of all ages, their parents and carers, diverse communities, et cetera. Um, you mentioned cyberbullying in particular. So we do have a legislated scheme where we um, are empowered to receive, investigate, and take action against uh, cyberbullying material that's targeting children under the age of 18. Um, cyberbullying is defined as material that's seriously threatening, harassing, intimidating, or humiliating. <clears throat> and uh, when those complaints come to us, we have the power to issue removal notices either to the services where the material is posted or to the end user who's responsible for posting the material. Um, in the vast majority of cases, we don't actually escalate to that notice power, to those formal powers that we have. We do have strong relationships with the social media services, um, and we find that we get the quickest and most effective takedown response by reaching out to them informally using those relationships. And uh, we do have quite a high success rate in having that material taken down quickly. Um, that said, and somebody mentioned before that there's a, a sort of a complicated relationship between cyberbullying and in-person bullying. With the complaints that we receive, which are about, uh, I think, a thousand a year at this point, we do find that the majority of them um, do involve sort of a complicated underlying face-to-face -face bullying that exists as well, and, and particularly in the school environment. So um, one of the roles that we have found ourselves playing through this scheme is that we actually provide the social media services with that additional context about what's going on offline that they can't always see. Um, and then we do work with um, children and young people themselves, with their parents, carers, with their schools to try to sort out some of those underlying offline um, interrelationships as well. Um, and just to make sure that everybody's aware of what's going on in addition to referring kids to support services like Kids Helpline to help them out. Um, and I won't say sort of too much about it, but we also have an image-based abuse scheme as well, which is for, um, it's for people of all ages. Um, it's around the threatened or actual sharing of um, intimate images. And um, about 25 to 30% of our complaints do come from children and young people under the age of 18. And we do find that quite a lot of those aren't actually about sort of relationships breaking down. A lot of them are about, um, kids meeting other people who they believe to be kids online. Um, and then once they establish a relationship and start exchanging images, um, they start receiving threats to share that material if they don't produce sort of greater quantities um, and, and sort of more intense material. Um, and of course that is a, a very serious criminal offense. It's a form of grooming, it's a form of child sexual exploitation. And we work very closely with the police um, on matters that come into us. Thanks, Kelly. I mean, you've raised a number of things that I'm sure are going to be quite uh, worrisome for, for the audience today and, and any parent who, who listens to this. Um, what do you think needs to be done uh, in terms of regulation? Because it, it, it sounds like we're going to discuss in a minute some things that parents might be able to do in their own situation, their own families at home. But what do we as a society need to do uh, in terms of industry and government uh, now moving forward? And, and, and I don't know if you're able to comment on that, but it'd be very helpful to, to, to get some insights, I think. Yeah, sure. And before I do, I might just say it is really important to emphasize that these are very serious risks and harms. But as the other panelists have said, there are such great benefits to being online as well. And one of the paradoxes is that... Um, you know, children can use the online world to actually reach out for help seeking, including to the office of the e-safety commissioner when they are experiencing these troubles. So I just wanted to sort of make that plug. Um, but uh, Australia is actually at the forefront, I would say, of, of regulating the um, online industry. Um, people may know that the new Online Safety Act was just passed in June. It received royal assent in July, and it's going to take effect in January. Um, it provides an expansion of some of those regulatory um, complaint schemes that I just mentioned. And so, for example, the existing cyberbullying scheme is sort of limited to social media services and those who are, who are either sort of declared um, to be a part of it or who opt in. Um, there's going to be a broad extension of that to sort of the, the full suite of online services, including um, gaming platforms where we know a lot of bullying tends to occur. Um, there's also a shortening of the takedown periods when we do send out formal notices for removal um, across all of our schemes, um, but that is at that sort of um, end of the protection where harm has already occurred. And so we are trying to do more of that proactive systemic change piece, including through our legislation. So um, it, it provides for the development of a series of industry codes or standards um, for a, a very broad swath of online industry, um, straight across from the device manufacturers and suppliers 
um, through to ISPs and then the major platforms themselves. Um, those focus on uh, content issues. So class one and class two content, which is around sort of the very high end illegal child sexual exploitation and abuse, pro terror content down to the, the lower end material, which is um, things like adult pornography that's um, you know, not necessarily harmful for adults, but could be quite harmful for children developmentally. Um, and so those codes will seek to put sort of minimum compliance measures in for those industry services um, based on risk. And uh, we're looking to take an outcomes-based approach and the development of those codes will continue um, until around July. We're hoping that the first set of codes will be put in place um, to start addressing those issues. Um, the other thing that the act introduces is a set of basic online safety expectations, which are set in a ministerial instrument. Um, and that has actually just gone out. A draft instrument has gone out for public consultation um, being held by the Department of Infrastructure um, and, and has a, a sort of broad array of expectations that will apply to um, social media services, websites, um, messaging services uh, around expectations that they keep their users safe. And then if the e-safety commissioner believes that a service is not living up to those expectations, we have some transparency reporting um, powers that we have um, in order to be able to sort of dig into the black box that we kind of find industry can sometimes be um, to get more details about how they're actually living up to those expectations. Uh, thanks, Kelly. That's a very detailed response. And, and, and personally, it, it sounds like there's a lot of work uh, going on there and certainly recognition of the problem. Um, I, I think that would be uh, sort of reassuring about the systemic response to these issues. And I think it would be important now just to move on into some practical areas that we can leave this panel discussion, having some optimism that we could manage screen times a little bit better in our own home. And, and probably the best person to start uh, this, this discussion would be Michael, because Michael, you've, you're a professional um, uh, advisor to parents. I've seen you on morning television doing that sort of stuff, and you've written a book on starting secondary school. Um, you, you've brought up some of these challenges that you're you're hearing about in, in your service. But what advice can you give parents uh, in relation to managing screen time for their preteens? Well, I can't go past um, a recommendation to log on to www.esafety.gov.au. Um, backslash parents, because that's got some wonderful material. But generally speaking, I think you need to set boundaries for digital devices in your home. That means no devices in bedrooms or bathrooms for young children, all screens off in bedrooms after a certain time for older children, uh, all screens off at least one hour before bedtime, um, all family members should switch off at dinner time because I think your role modelling is crucial in this and that devices should be charged overnight in a place where your children can't access them. Generally speaking, we have to recognise that technology um, is really the, the perfect storm now. Um, we've got significant cyber safety issues because young people's brains are still developing, but they're using a technology which is in the moment and of the moment. And that has created the perfect storm. So parents really do need to be quite proactive in um, doing the sorts of things that I've talked about. Thanks, Michael. Uh, good practical advice. I think that would be the ideal scenario, certainly. And Anthea, um, from your consideration of the results of the RCH poll, um, what would your advice be to parents? Um, thanks, Sarah. So I think uh, what we've learned from the poll and as a parent myself... You're just, you're just breaking up a little bit, Anthea. Um, ...four kids from one through to sort of 12 years of age that they know parents are. Is that any better with the video off, Sarah? That is so, better, yeah. Um, just saying, as a parent myself of, of four kids between age one and, and 12 years, and what we've learned from the poll is that the really great advice that Michael has just given us about having screen-free bedtime, screen-free meal times, setting boundaries and being aware as a parent of your role modeling when it comes to screen use. Parents know about this stuff, but they find it really, really hard to do. And um, parents have told us that, you know, that role as a moderator, if you like, of time and content is a big burden 
it's frequently a cause of conflict um, in households. So just putting that out there because I think it's really important for parents listening um, and you might feel that sinking sort of feeling as you hear this advice because you think, oh, I know all that, but it's really hard. That said, it still is really important. And sometimes some of those things that are tough, there's not an easy way around them. And um, I would reinforce that advice from Michael where parents can, can do it because there is good evidence that it is some of the stuff that makes a difference. So healthier sort of screen habits and thinking not just about how much screens and technology are used in your house, but how they're used. So making some of those interactions positive, doing the sorts of things that we heard, you know, Bjorn talking about that we know um, build positive relationships and uh, are good ways to use screens and healthy screen habits in households. Thinking about building those things in rather than just what you're trying to stop doing. It's a bit like if you're, you know, go back to parenting advice with kids and some of you might remember the idea that instead of telling your child don't run don't run you've got to say I'll oh, slow down or walk so giving the advice about what you would like them to do is really helpful um, I think when it comes to practically making a difference so on a daily basis what that might mean is think about what you can schedule into the day that's not screen based or that is a positive type of screen use and if you do that then um, there's going to be less time spent in some of the areas that might be less positive or more risky. So structuring in the positive things is a really practical tip. Um, and also just to echo for parents the practical stuff that they can um, get from logging onto the eSafety uh, website. A lot of the concerns from parents that we learnt through the poll do relate to those issues around safety that we've just heard in detail about from Kelly and you know, really do make you feel nervous as a parent. And knowing that that stuff does go on validates some of those concerns. So rather than sitting with them and being anxious, a lot of parents told us in the poll that they don't feel well enough informed or they don't feel like they've got enough tech skills to oversee things from a safety point of view. So go online to the eSafety website, upskill yourself. Sometimes as a parent it's, or just as a person, if something's hard, we pull away and we sort of give up. I would really encourage parents to actually lean into these challenges, try and get yourself more informed. What you can learn online is a lot. Schools will also offer um, good support in many situations that's practical. Don't be afraid to put your hand up and say, I'm worried about this, but I've got no idea how to do it. Particularly where you might feel your kids who are even as young as eight or nine have really already outstripped you when it comes to knowing how to navigate the tech. So upskill yourself is another really important way to empower yourself as a parent to make a difference. That's great. Thanks, Anthea. Um, I'll, I'll turn to you, Lisa. Um, any, anything else you, you wish to add? Um, and, and particularly, I think you or, or one of the panellists mentioned earlier role modelling uh, for us as parents. Yeah, that's right. I think Michael might have said about being a good role model. And I think that that's really, really important um, is that we have to also, you know, as much as we can, it's really hard, um, especially with lockdown and stuff that we're reaching for our phones and our screens much more as well. But try and be a bit more mindful about not taking the phones to the um, to the dinner table, you know, and, and having some some screen off time and um, picking up on some of Anthea's points as well. I think um, kind of it's really important, not just the time that children spend on devices but also what they're doing on the devices so I think kind of thinking about those kind of three c's the kind of um, connect create contribute so if you, the children are connecting with their peers connecting with family who might not they might not be able to see in lockdown creating content um, you know be that videos or um, you know blogs that sort of thing and contributing to discussions and things online that that's likely to have a, a positive impact so picking up on sort of as, as I said on some of the things Anthea was saying um, I think that's really important to try and um, get some of those more positive aspects of screen use in because screens aren't going away um, so you know it's it's about how do we support young people to to use them in a positive way um, the other thing as well I think is about helping find quality content as well and as um, the other panelists have said there are lots of resources out there to help parents now um, you know for example Raising Children Network have some really good resources on their website the Australian Council of Children and Media also have some really good resources as well um, where they'll rate um, you know apps and, and videos um, and you know movies and things
things which can help guide parents as something that might be marketed as educational might not be all that educational for example and you know thinking about the sort of violence and things that might be being presented um so i think it's really not just about the quantity um you know and as we've said in this uh, at the moment particularly that that quantity is is up and we and we can't get away from you know needing to use screens but really trying to think about how um, the, the quality um, and how, what we're doing online um, and with screens is, is as positive as possible. Well thanks Lisa. Um, Pauline we said right at the beginning when you expressed some of your concerns as a parent that we would try and, uh, and discuss some of those and, and maybe provide some practical pointers um, we're coming to the end of our sort of panel discussion before we open up the, the platform for questions, but I just wanted to uh, give you the opportunity of uh, finishing up, maybe uh, if it's a challenge for you, I suppose, but could you just sort of summarise what you may have learned from this and any final comments you wish to make in, in relation to your own experiences? Yeah, I guess as a, as a parent listening to all this, um, I certainly... Um, have taken some, some good tips, particularly on boundaries, particularly on um, uh, reaffirming for me that my concerns are valid. I think from the poll research and from the experts as well, knowing that there are resources out there, out there like Kelly's talking about, um, reminding ourselves to look at the positives like Bjorn was talking about, and just some um, practical tips as well in terms of the hour before, um, you know, Michael said, making sure that that screens aren't used and um, hold, trying to hold those boundaries. And I think my overriding comment would be to, to um, I know I try and practice a bit of self-compassion during lockdown, especially, but just to be a little kind to yourself as parents to mm -hmm. say, even if you've had screen creep or um, you've forgotten to set the parental controls, one day, whatever's going on in your life at the moment, just to be kind to yourself as parents as, and you're doing the best you can each day. Um, because I do feel there's a lot of pressure and conflict around this issue, trying to manage um, the amount of times kids is, and, and, that are using you know, on screens and, and the conflict that's creeping into households around that. So having the energy to maintain those boundaries that Michael um, is recommending and trying to balance outside life and inside life at the moment, particularly in the pandemic. Well, thanks very much, Pauline. That was a, a difficult ask of you, but did superbly there. Not at all. You're very um, welcome. Um, I'd just like to thank everyone for, for listening uh, and thanking uh, the panelists here who've done a great job in responding to all of these queries and questions and things that I've thrown at you in the audience as well. We're really grateful for your participation. Uh, and thank you also to Kate Anderson uh, for organising this. I'd like to just hand over to my boss, the Dean, uh, Professor Jane Gunn, uh, to close the, the session. Look, thanks, Sarath, and thanks to all the panellists and, and most importantly to the audience. Um, I've really enjoyed the, the seminar today. I hope that you have. I found the three C's uh, ones that I instantly remembered. So thanks. Thanks for that. Um, and also, of course, the fourth one, which was in a lot of the chat around conflict, um, which is obviously one of the things that people are really uh, challenged by the conflict that this brings up within within homes and classrooms, etc. Um, and so I can see lots of people wanting tips for how to, to deal with that. Look, I do hope um, that we're able to get back to you um, with some of the answers to the questions in chat and we'll ask Kate and co to collect those and, and maybe impose upon our panel members to um, get their words of wisdom. And we will be um, posting that with email links to those of you who've attended today. Um, the In Pursuit of Health series wants to bring topics like this to your um, living room or office or wherever you are. Um, and so if you're interested in taking part in other seminars, please follow us on Twitter at UMELBMDHS and that will be put in the chat today. Um, once again, I hope everyone's taking care of themselves in lockdown. Um, battling with the screens is going to be a challenge. And I do hope that today some of the tips have been of assistance to you. And I would add a final one that um, parents unite around this um, and that being together and helping each other out is another way of uh, getting um, to uh, put some boundaries, as Michael Cargreg was saying, around this very tricky issue. Um, I hope to see you again soon and thank you again. Have a lovely afternoon. Thank you.